Welcome to the Cool Tools Show. I'm Mark Frauenfelder, Editor-in-Chief of Cool Tools, a website of tool recommendations written by our readers. You can find us at cool-tools.org. I'm joined by my co-host, Kevin Kelly, founder of Cool Tools. Hey, Kevin. Hey, it's great to be here. In each episode of the Cool Tools Show, Kevin and I talk to a guest about some of his or her favorite uncommon and uncommonly good tools they think others should know about. Our guest this week is Kurt Kolstad. Kurt writes and talks about design and cities at the popular podcast 99% Invisible. He's been covering design, art, and urbanism professionally across various platforms since completing his master's degree in architecture in 2007. Hey, Kurt, welcome to the Cool Tools podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, yeah, a real pleasure to have you here, and I'm looking forward to what you have in store for us. Oh, great. I am too. <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, uh, Kevin and I are huge fans of 99% Invisible. I've been listening to it. What is it like? Is it 10 years old now or more? Yeah, it just turned 10 this year. So okay. we're celebrating our 10th yeah. anniversary. Nice. And yeah, it's great. I it's think I've been listening to it for 10 years, at least nine years. Yeah, and so yeah. um, uh, you were quite familiar with it. And we'll be looking forward to talking about the book uh, uh, that you were involved with at the end. But let's hear some of your cool tool picks. Yeah, tell us about this this uh, track point uh, <laughs> because that was yeah, I could never get used to that. But I want to hear you <laughs> talk about it. <laughs> I think a lot of people have trouble getting used to it, and in fact, disable it on their computers um, if their computer comes with this <laughs> thing. Uh, Can but you describe point, it first, so, so for those of us yeah. who don't know what it is? Absolutely. So the track point. Um, was originally designed in the early 90s, and then the name TrackPoint was then patented by IBM in the late 90s. And what it is is a mouse that is built into your keyboard. And it's got a bunch of different names that people will recognize it by. Um, it's sometimes called the eraser head mouse or um, a nub mouse. And it's basically situated on keyboards between the G, B, and H key. And I've been using these since I got my first laptop computer for college in 1998 and I will not buy a computer that does not have one of these. Wow. Wow. So, so, so and again, it's like a, it's about the size of an eraser head and it just sits right in between the keys, those keys that you mentioned. And I guess it's a little flexible so you can kind of push it with your finger in different directions. Is that the idea? That is the idea. And essentially, the amount of force you apply translates into the distance and speed it travels. So you could scroll infinitely with this mouse. You just push on it. And my favorite part is that since it's located in the middle of the keyboard, I don't have to lift my hands off the keys. And in fact, that was the whole genesis of this design was uh, one of the designers was looking at usability and was like, you know, every time somebody has to jump between a keyboard and a mouse, it takes almost a second. So what if we could just eliminate that second entirely? So they came up with this track point. And since then, it's gone on to be used uh, in other computers too. Like IBM pioneered this thing, but now you, you can find them on a bunch of other computers. And I, I absolutely love it. And, and what I discovered um, with my latest model is this thing got shipped to me and it didn't have the specific type of track point I like. So to clarify, there's like the device that is part of the machine and there's like a little nub that goes over that and that's interchangeable. Mm -hmm. And in this newest model, they didn't have the version that was uh, concave that you could sort of put your finger into, which makes it easier to steer. And so I Googled around and I found some guy on Etsy whose entire store is just dedicated to selling people concave track point replacement mice because they're no longer supported by fingers. I love wow. that. Wow, wow. So which finger do you use? It's my right index finger. Okay. Although if you were a left-handed person, you could just as easily use your left index finger. Okay. Could you use it like in Adobe Illustrator or Photoshop? I mean, is that, or is it more for writing? Because I just feel like the control is so limited with this thing. Yeah, that is probably the toughest part. And in fact, when I am using something like Photoshop or Illustrator, I do switch to an external mouse because it does give me more control. So for web browsing, for jumping around inside of a document, it is great. It is perfect. It, it does everything it needs to do. But when I need an external mouse, I have this Logitech Performance MX that I absolutely love. It's like 
super ergonomic. It has this dark field laser technology, so it works on literally any surface, including reflective glass. And I've been using Logitech mice ever since (laughs) I started using mice, too. So I Uh I literally stock up on these things. So if one breaks, I have the next one queued up. Okay. So since it's almost like 28 years old, how come everybody's not using one? I have wondered that as well. I think it's the learning curve. I think people get a device with one of these. They try it out and it's hard. It's hard to get down the, the you know amount of pressure you need to push it around. And so people just kind of give up on it. They're used to other mice. They say, well, I don't really need this thing. And so they either opt for the, like a built-in trackpad or an external mouse. And, and I'll admit, like if I encountered this today for the first time, I doubt I would pick it up either. But once you learn how to use it, it is just absolutely the best. And as I said, I mean, I will not get a machine that doesn't have one of these things. <laughs> like, it's that important to me. So do people offer uh, alternative keyboards that have this? Like if you have like a, if you want an Apple keyboard for your iPad or something like that, or one of those um, external keyboards, do are people on Etsy altering and, and, and adding um, versions of it that have the trackpad in it? Trackpoint, whatever it's called. <laughs> yeah, it's it's called the Trackpoint by IBM. Although the it has all these different names because that's you know their their branded term. Right. Um, and that's a really good question, and I don't know the answer. I do not know if you can get an external keyboard that has one of these eraser head mice in it. Um, I've never looked into it because part of what I like about it is that it is built into the machine. So. So if I'm sitting at my desk, I can have whatever I want around me. I can have monitors, I can have external mice, whatever. But if I'm traveling, if I'm I'm on an airplane or in a car, I'm limited to to what's available in the device itself. So for me, having it integrated is really important. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Track points. Okay. So, um, and, and, but, but it sounds like though, to get this track point built in, you're limited to an IBM product? Or, no. Or, okay. Not necessarily. Yeah. In fact, um, over the years, let's see, uh, Dell, Asus, HP, Sony, Samsung, like all, all kinds of manufacturers have come up with versions of this. It just so happens that Lenovo, um, which sort of adopted the ThinkPad line from, from IBM, is the one that includes it in the most models. So when I go computer shopping, I usually just start there because I know I want this track point. Um, I mean, I'd be open to, to you know a different computer that had one, right? But uh, I just have never you know seen the need to look around, right? Um, and I was just looking at um, a Verge article, and it kind of reminded me. I was like, whether there was a non QWERTY version. And I think like there might be. You mean like a Dvorak keyboard? <laughs> yeah, well, track pad. If you're if you're really like a full nerd, yeah. that's what you do, <laughs> right? I mean, to me, I'm I'm amazed that this isn't in more keyboards, and that like, yeah, people who are like optimization geeks, right? Like people yeah. who want to yeah. squeeze every last like like extraneous feature out of the way. This just seems like such a natural thing to gravitate towards. It's just like you don't have yeah. to lift up your hands. It's right. right there. That's the whole thing with yeah. keyboard shortcuts is you're not lifting your hand up. Yeah, so, exactly. Like, like hands are, ultimate are word perfect where you never had to take your hands right. off the home key or the, the home, you know, row of row. keys to yeah. get everything done. Yeah, the home row. Right. Huh. Well, that's really cool. Okay. Well, that's something I hadn't thought about. Um, um, I don't – I want to try it now yeah, okay. and again with, with your recommendation. In <laughs> I mean, I do. That's what I recommend is like, find, you know, find some store that has these like shop models out and give it a spin and be prepared for a bit of a learning curve. But mm-hmm. once you know how to use it, wow, they are just the best. Cool. That sounds um, good. So in, you, you were also suggesting in the notes here that besides the, checkpoint mouse there was um the logitech performance mx which can you explain what that is and um and this is what you use w- when you aren't using the checkpoint yes and it's the latest in a long line um in fact it's not even the latest in a long line of mice that i have used from logitech so ever since i first discovered a uh, Logitech wireless mouse with what they call a dark field laser, which sounds super cool, and it actually is super cool, lives <laughs> up to the name. 
um, ever since I first found this, uh, this kind of anywhere, any surface technology from Logitech, I have been a Logitech mouse fanatic. And so I've, kept up with this over the generations and in fact i have a backlog at any given time of two spares wow because uh, i'm worried that if they take away you know if they take away a feature i like or, or redesign it in a way i don't like like I'm, I'm all for familiar tools right like once you've used something for a long time it's it's hard to move on to the next generation sometimes so i just just in case i have a couple spares <laughs> right yeah i know, I know that is we just had a podcast with a writer who Started writing on Word when you know he was in college and been writing on it for you know whatever it is thirty years or something <laughs> and knows that there's all these better tools, but that familiarity that he has is just sort of almost more important yes. than the little bit of increase in performance he might get from from switching. And I'll tell you a weird fact, but I am using Photoshop Elements. I believe it's number six. I believe it came <laughs> out in two thousand five. Yes. And I use it because I know it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I look at the newer versions and I say, well, yeah, there's new features and whatever, but I, this is everything I need it to do. So why right, would I right. change? And right. only recently, because they, it, it now looks tiny on a normal screen, have I been thinking, okay, I, I probably finally, 15 years later, need to go ahead and update my Photoshop. <laughs> well, the problem I have with those not updating things is that you're eventually, they just don't run on the new system unless you're not right. updating your entire system and that's a problem too because new things won't run on it so there's sort of a catch-22 yeah where i gave up trying to preserve old copies because it was in the end more trouble than it was worth and now i have this weird habit of upgrading on schedule whenever i can because i it's kind of like um i'm gonna pay for it somewhere down the line if i don't it's true. You're you're kind of delaying the pain by yes. by sticking with an existing version. Right. Yeah. You when you upgrade from Photoshop Express, you're gonna it's gonna be really painful. Oh, well, that was that's the thing. So so with my new computer, I bought like the latest version, and I was like, I don't even know how to use this. Yeah. So now I'm thinking, well, do I do I just bite the bullet and relearn all of Photoshop, or do I like? get something in between. So I created this mess for myself that I'll have to get out of. Yeah. I suggest actually you don't use sort of, you switch to Pixelmator or something like that. That is, mm. um, does everything and is much saner and more, you know, I mean, if, if, if the Photoshop version that you were using is sufficient, this will be sufficient for you and doesn't have the whole subscription nonsense that Adobe now has. Yes. Yeah. That, I mean, that was a big turnoff for me too, is, is this switch from, I'm like, I, I grew up in an age where you bought a program and you owned it and I right. like yeah. that. Um, and right. so the subscription model is a big turnoff for me. So yeah, I will look into that. Thank you. Yeah. So I use Pixelmator. I don't know what you use, Mark. Um, well, you know, I, I do use Photoshop just because it's again, right. I'm used You're to familiar it. with using it. it for decades. So, right. But I think it's Pixelmator is a good alternative mm -hmm. if you were kind of just using it for, I'm not even sure what you're using it for, but like if you're doing, you know, I don't know, type stuff or simple alterations, you know, maybe some healing, just basic kind of things, Pixelmator is perfectly fine. It is good. And I've used Pixelmator for a number of years also. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds like it would be sufficient for me. I mean, mostly I'm just resizing things, making, you know, yeah. uh, montages, adding text, uh, you know, yeah. sometimes you use clone stamp to kind of like patch up sure. an area. This will be, patch. this will be fine for you. Um, I'm sure. Um, there, there, I was just going to quickly say that um, th there's this great illustrator, Bob Stack, done a bunch of New Yorker covers. He does children's books and he is using like a, an ancient Mac and Photoshop three to do everything. <laughs> it's like, that's incredible. From like, you know, like the early two thousands or, or earlier because he, I guess, you know, somehow they, they work, they, they, the New Yorker editor is willing to work with whatever, however he delivers the files. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I love it. I hope he has a backup. I hope he has a spare machine because that <laughs> yeah. thing isn't going to last forever. Yeah. I think there's a yeah. term called pickling, isn't it? Where you like keep the hardware so that you can run oh. old legacy software. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. You, you probably want to have an old machine going with it on. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. yeah. Or, em or em emulations. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, we just recently, um, somebody came out with an emulation to emulate HyperCard on the web so we could take cool. the whole Earth catalog, which we did in HyperCard in the 80s. Uh, so it was the web before there was a web. Oh, yeah. And um, we, nobody, none of us ever seen it because so few copies of the CD were made. They were made to, by Apple to sell Apple's uh, CD-ROMs, which never sold. Um, <laughs> so I had not seen it in, I don't know, 25, 30 years. And it was now because someone had made an emulator um, on the web to run it. So you could, you could run those oh, things wow. on the web. Uh, That's incredible. Yeah. yeah. I actually play a video game that was made in the 80s that somehow amazingly is still stumbling along and compatible with Windows. And I, I it will die sometime. I mean, it, not, <laughs> this cannot last, but it is What's amazing. What's called? It's called Bolo, and it's a tank game. And you, you have this top-down view, and you're driving around in this tank, and you harvest resources and take bases. It's a multiplayer online game. And, you know, so back in the 90s, that that was incredible. The idea that, you know, 16 yeah. of us could all play. Um, and, yeah. <laughs> and people still cool. play. I think very few, very few. Well, that's great. So, um, so Kurt, tell us about another um, favorite tools of, of yours. Sure, yeah. The the uh, Fisher Space Pen has been on my list for a long time. And partly it's because I just like it. It's a pen. Can you describe it for, for people who are not familiar with it? Yes. So the Fisher Space Pen is a pen that works in essentially any orientation. Uh, it has a pressurized cartridge. So the ink is pushed out. Um, and so you can write upside down. You can write in space. <laughs> you can, <laughs> you know, you, it works in very hot and cold temperatures. It's designed to, to like last for 100 years and work anywhere. And one of the things I like about it is that it has this kind of apocryphal origin story that gets passed around. Um, and the story is simply, while... NASA was spending millions of dollars developing the perfect pen for outer space. The Soviets just used a pencil. And it, it makes for a great <laughs> little anecdote, but it's totally yeah. untrue. <laughs> it's absolutely right. I've heard it. It's a good story, though. It's a great little story. Um, but no. It's, un it's untrue in the sense that the Russians didn't use pencils? Well, as it turns out, both the Russians and Americans used grease pencils and mechanical pencils for for a long time. The problem is that little bits of graphite, if they break off and they get in the machinery, I mean, you can imagine, right? You're in zero G, mm -hmm. you have very delicate systems. And so like any dust or, or anything else that kind of breaks loose in that environment could be really dangerous. Right, right. Um, so there was this really, it was like an important consideration for NASA, but the origin of the space pen is just, this guy named Fisher, who who took his company, spent like millions of dollars in, in R&D and came up with this space pen. And then he basically gave it to, to NASA and to the Russians. And <laughs> it's been used in space. Um, <clears throat> and there's various models now. But And but, why did you like it? If you're not writing zero G, <laughs> what, 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 um, what, what's the advantage to you for, for using it? So for me, it's just it's just like a go anywhere, will work anywhere pen. I you know if I leave, if I like if I I'm always skeptical of traveling on planes with certain pens because I you know there's every once in a while one kind of just explodes and um, and so just having like a small pen that is reliable and I don't have to like wait for the ink to kind of like make its way down the barrel if I've got it the wrong way or whatever else. It's just kind of this very useful compact way of having a writing utensil I can rely on. Um, and I also just have a lot of respect for it as a universal design. Um, I just wrote this article about about how the world is still designed for right-handers, even though, you know, 10% of the global population, over half a billion people are left-handed. Are you left-handed? I am not. Um, but left-handedness is this kind of example that's often used in bias training, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just a great way of, of making real something that people can relate to, right? So, you know, people may not be able to relate to the cultural experiences of others, um, you know, genders, other things, but everybody knows somebody who's left-handed. <laughs> and if you ask that person, right. they will say, the world is full of things that are not designed for me. 
And so I kind of like also, <laughs> I feel like in a weird way, I'm supporting um, <laughs> ambidextrous universal yeah. design yeah. by yeah. having these pens. Okay. Because I could give I it to a left-handed friend and they could use it. Unlike a ballpoint, which you'd have to kind of, you know, they ha- have to push against the page, which ends up not working out very well. Okay. Uh, so I, I'm actually I'm not really clear why it, it works better than a ballpoint pen for an FDs, but I'll um, take your word for it. Left-handed people using ballpoints means they're pushing, like you pick, just picture it in your mind, right? You're holding a pen in your left hand. You're pushing it against the page as you move across the page. That tends to dry up the ink, tends to not work very well. And so there are a bunch of pens specially designed for lefties. Some are like weirdly S-shaped. There's all kinds of ways of solving this design problem. But the Fisher Space Pen does it elegantly by just saying, okay, this pen will work in any orientation because the pressure is is forcing the ink out onto the page. So you could be in bed writing upside down. You could be a right-handed person or a left-handed person, and this thing will just work. Okay. Okay. So, so it's pushing the ink out and it's not being dragged. Or, exactly. Okay. That and makes... so you're not relying on gravity. You're, right, and, right. Right. Yeah. It, there's all these things that we just kind of think, well, ballpoints work well enough. And that's true if you're a right-handed person writing on a flat piece of paper, <laughs> but um, this takes it up a notch. Okay. Great. Okay. That's fantastic. Um, and they don't seem to be that expensive and um, they're available pretty easily. Yeah. And there's cartridges too that you can use to like swap into other pens. Um, uh-huh. There's various models. Yeah. It, so it's not that you need to get a Fisher Space pen <laughs> necessarily, but uh, it's just like a type of pen essentially that is pretty useful. Okay. So tell us about um, Google Docs. Oh, wow. It makes me feel so old to think about <laughs> how many years I spent. Uh, you know, using docs that had to be passed back and forth. Um, mm-hmm. And the ability to share in Google Docs, I don't think I fully realized its power until I joined 99% Invisible. And in our edits, we sit down, we all listen. We might be in the same room, or some of us might be remote, but we can all be in the same digital space making notes in real time while we listen to a draft of an episode. So you'll have people commenting on the side and like commenting on other people's comments. And it's that real time sharing that makes Google Docs and things like it powerful. And to me, I'm not I'm not trying to upsell Google in particular. I'm sure there are other (laughs) document sharing programs that are just as good. Uh, It just so happens that's the one I use. And and it's just been revolutionary to me as a person who works uh, in writing and other creative uh, text-based endeavors. And, and do you have any um, particular, I won't make call it hacks for using Google Docs that you've discovered? Like one of the one of the issues I had with Google Docs in trying to write a collaborative with someone is we wanted to be able to track what each person was adding to it in a, with a different color or some way to make it really visible. Um, all, the same text. So if I added a sentence into that text, it would be my color. And if he added it, it would be in his color. We weren't able to do that, or unless you figured out a way to do that. If you well, made it, we just change the color, it would appear. Well, yes, yeah, so you have to change your color each time, but yeah. that was just a pain. Like, a, a, you know, Word docs would have a way to, to track author changes, and you could do mm-hmm. it there. So have you have you uncovered any kind of hacks for, for using it in a collaborative way? So there is a mode that is different from editing called suggesting. And if you toggle yourself to that mode, anything you write, and anything you delete is is basically tentative. It requires approval. Um, and so it shows up in your color versus someone else's color. Oh, now, the okay. thing I haven't figured out is if you can make those colors uh, persistent across uh, different... So, like, sometimes it will be, like, I'm blue and Roman's red, and sometimes it would be the opposite. And I'm not sure if there's a hack for that, although I should look into that. But yeah, so if you use suggestive suggesting mode, uh, you can you can see all these changes and then just choose not to resolve them until you're feeling comfortable about where that mm. thing is. And I use that a lot. So comments are great. Uh, I also like you know having comment conversations on the sidelines. 
but being able to suggest in the space and then comment on your own suggestion. Uh, in some cases, I'll I'll type in something, I'll say, I'm not sure this, and then I'll make a comment on my own my own text and say, I'm not sure this is the right wording, but you get the idea. And then maybe, mm-hmm. you know, somebody else can help me word it better. Yeah. That's cool. That's cool. That's a good, that's a good tip about uh, just using suggested suggestion mode and then not accepting it till you're, you're all finished. Right. right. Yeah. That's and it's cool. super that's important if good. you've got, you know, 10 people editing it, <laughs> a single story, um, yeah. you don't, like the last thing you want to do is to accidentally change the the fundamental file <laughs> in a way that the producer might miss, right? right so right. so that, being able to track that is is super important right. to the process. I mean, if you when you have collaboration tools, tracking tr- tracking changes is the paramount chore. Just making sure that um, yeah, you don't undo things inadvertently and lose and lose them, or uh, also being able to track who's making what changes. So those kinds of things become ever more important when you have a kind of a cloud-based collaboration. Uh, yeah, but that's a yeah. great hack. I'll have to try that one. Okay, yeah. cool. So um, I, I just in the interest of time, because we have to to wrap up in five or six minutes, um, let's talk quickly about the finished drish dish drying closet sure yeah so the finished dish drying closet is a basically a cabinet that sits above your sink and the shelves are porous they have slits in them so that you can stack your dishes up there and they will just dry by draining into the sink below and it's this finished design i never heard of it until this fan wrote in and said you really have to make this a global thing. Um, <laughs> he had just moved to Sweden from Finland and was just shocked they didn't have this. And the more I've read about it, the more I'm like, why don't we have this everywhere? So here's the the gist of it. the advantages are it saves you space because you don't have to have a drying rack next to your sink or, you know, even a dishwasher. Um, it's, it's more sort of eco-friendly, just sort of self-drying. And then... My favorite part is just that it saves time, right? You can just take your dishes Mm -hmm. and put them right on the shelf and they'll just dry over time by themselves. Right, and to kind of explain, this is like a cupboard. Like if you had some dish cupboards over your counters or your sink, this would be inside that cupboard. You'd open up the door and there would be these racks that would be open, wired racks that would be open to the ground below them and the water would just... The dishes would be in the cupboard drying. Yes. And um, so in, cool. in Finnish, they're called oh, yeah. Askins Kuisvoskapi. And the guy who wrote in about them, he, according to him, he has never been in a Finnish home that did not have one of these. Wow. So, like, this to him was just a thing that people had. And, and that's kind of what I love about these regional designs is sometimes people don't even realize how regional, like, their favorite or useful designs are until they go somewhere else and say, I just take that for granted. <laughs> well, the, the weird thing of, is that this is listed as an Ikea pro- product, which means that it's probably available anywhere in the U S which is like, who's buying them that we've never seen them. And, and why does Ikea only have like one version of this too? I, I, yeah. I think it's a very small market that knows about these. And Ikea has sort of tapped into it. And there's these kind of freestanding ones, too, that you can install yourself kind of above the sink. But they, you know, they also get in the way of washing dishes. I'm not sure if any of those are, are the best option. Um, but I, I love the kind of original finished version of this, which is just to build it into your home. Uh, yeah, I have a friend who built one himself just with wood slats. Um, then it sits kind of off, t- off the side of his sink and close enough. Um, and yeah, so you can make your own if you were really up to it, but, um, these pre-made ones look pretty cool too. Yeah. I mean, I'm surprised they're really inexpensive. I think the Ikea versions are like $30. Um, I'm sure there are definitely ways to DIY this and, and whatnot, but, um, it seems like, (laughs) I don't know if I was an entrepreneur in this space, I would be out there (laughs) building, you know, some kind of mass produced version of this because I think. Every home could benefit from one of these. This is really great. In the last couple of minutes we have, Kurt, can you tell us about your fantastic book, which I have been reading slowly, not in order, (laughs) according to to the instructions I've heard. (laughs) um, But tell us us about it. Right. So The 99% Invisible City is a field guide to the hidden world of everyday design. And – 
it's not a typical book. <laughs> it is part field guide, part um, nonfiction short stories about designs from around the world. But most importantly, it's a guide to not just one city, but every city. So the idea isn't that, you know, you take this with you to Florence and you find all the neat things in Florence. The idea is that you take it, read it, and start noticing things on your own block, in your own city, everyday stuff, manhole covers, um, fire hydrants, fire escapes, uh, those spray painted markings on the ground that denote underground utilities. We get really into those and help people notice them and understand, you know, the stories behind them, but also just tell neat stories about them. Right. Right. So for, for those people, readers, listeners, who for some reason may not be familiar with the podcast 99% Invisible, what that refers to is that the fact that most of our important infrastructure that surrounds us are, is kind of invisible to our attention. We're not aware of it, yet it's sitting there and it, you know, it, 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 it constitutes 99% of what there is, but we kind of don't see it. And Kurt in... Roman and the crew and on the podcast and this book are paying attention to all that stuff that we normally just glance right by. Right. And, and the first two chapters kind of set you up a little bit for just noticing things and, and, and thinking about this in a different way, because we cover kind of this range, right. From things that you don't notice because they're actually hard to notice because they're small to things that you see every day and have never thought twice about like the little boxes next to the entrances of buildings that are there with keys inside so that firefighters can come open the box, access the building without breaking down doors or windows so they can get in faster to help people. They don't create uh, destruction or debris that will get in everybody's way. So it's like little things like that, that you, for whatever reason, <laughs> probably never thought that much about. Uh, well, we think about that kind of stuff a lot. Right. And so it's, it's, so it's a book that has stories, a little bit of kind of a feel guide, some illustrations uh, describing what they're talking about. And I would have to say from my own experience, um, you'll learn something on every page about the things that are around you, even on your own street. I am thrilled to hear that you're, <laughs> that you're having a good experience with the book that way. And, and as you said earlier, um, it is meant to be something you could read this cover to cover. You, you could pick this book up and read it from start to finish. And it has arcs and bigger kind of ideas that come about that way. But you can also just use it like a field guide. You can flip open to a page, read about a new thing, uh, go to the index, look up a thing that you saw and aren't quite sure what it means. <laughs> um, there's also a 20 page small font bibliography. So we, we have a lot of additional reading for people who are, you know, want to learn more about something. So in a way, it's like a cities 101. It's like an introductory guide to seeing and thinking about your city in a new way. It's really great. So, um, yeah, I, I, um, recommend the book. I recommend the podcast and, um, hope you guys keep going and, um, have another 10 years. Yeah, Thanks. Yeah. I, I really appreciate you having me. I, I mean, on a personal note, one of the first things that I did when I moved to the Bay area was I came to, uh, <laughs> to an event at the long now foundation and watched you speak, Kevin, ah. and got you to sign two copies of cool tools. Oh, wow. One for me and one for my dad, who is both a, a tool geek and uh -huh. a material scientist. So he's just, wow. he's really, you know, well, it's really up his alley. So, so we so, have met, I'm, and, and I'm sorry that I didn't recognize No, that. I was just a person in the crowd. I get it. Like, I just, I, I, I was just like, oh, God, I hope it's not too much to ask him to sign two of these but okay no well that's <laughs> fantastic thank you i'm glad so, you enjoyed cool tools yeah. and uh, you've completed the circle by being on our podcast which we really really are grateful for and you had great tools stuff that we didn't know about the finished drying closet oh wow <laughs> this is really great so um um, yeah, I really do uh, hope that you continue doing what you're doing because I think it's really fantastic and I'm a fan. Thank you so much. I'm a huge fan as well. So please also keep doing what you're doing. All right. Kurt, so Alrighty, great, great talking to you, finding out about your tools and everything. Good luck. And uh, we would love to have you on the show again sometime because you seem like you have more in your cornucopia. <laughs> yeah. 
Always, always. I can always geek out more about these things. <laughs> hey, everybody, it's your host, Mark, and I wanted to thank you for listening to The Cool Tools Show. And I also wanted to let you know that we've got a lot more going on at Cool Tools than just this podcast. We also have the Cool Tools website, which has a new tool review every day, and you can get there by going to cool-tools.org. We also have four different newsletters that you can subscribe to, and you can subscribe to those from the Cool Tools page. We have this podcast that you're listening to right now. We also have a YouTube channel where we review tools. Check that YouTube channel out by going to youtube.com slash cool tools. And one of the things I'd like to ask you is if you're really enjoying everything that we are producing, go to our Patreon page and support us there. You can sign up and give us as little as $1 a month, and that would mean a lot to us. The money that we get from Patreon goes towards a lot of things. We transcribe our podcast interviews so that you can read them online. We pay for editing of our podcasts and for our videos. We pay our contributors. We have video production costs. We have equipment costs. We have hosting costs. And the money you give us through Patreon also goes to support Cool Tools Lab. Anything you give is a huge help. And one of the things that we do is if you are a contributor to Patreon, we'll give you a shout out on air. And so I have a few people here to thank this week. Mark Lyonage, Micah Gates, Monty Zukowski, Patrick James McNally, Robert Cohen, Scott, Spence Lloyd, Steve Avery, Steve Golden, Steve Levine, Tom Hess, William Phillips, Aaron Nipper, Darab Patel, Glenn Mercer, Jay Walker, Jeff Bonner, Ryan Jarrell, Pat Daly, Patrick Kennedy, Troy Wallet, Mike Camerate, Nicole Harkin, Tim Youssef, Scott Reed. Thanks all of you for supporting Cool Tools. And if you would like to have a shout out, go over to the Patreon page and sign up. And thanks for listening to the Cool Tools podcast. We'll see you next week.